a chance. You're not here because, oh, well, maybe somebody invited you. No, this was an ordained deal for you and God. I believe God has been preparing this message for us to stand in the gap, for us to fight through the uncomfortable places, for us to answer the unanswered questions. And many times we think God does it all, but God is going to challenge us to say, what are you doing? I've given you everything, and what are you doing? So tonight, guess what? You have an opportunity to change your life forever. There's a little bit of reverb on here. Help me out because I'm a woman, and I know I don't want to be annoying to the men. So help me out on the mic. Check, check, check. All right. Awesome. Now, if you don't know who I am, hi. (laughs) We're having a weird service tonight, but you know what? I want to worship God, and I never want to be ashamed of it. My name is Pastor Jess. I'm going to push this church into passion and praise. I'm going to push you guys. I'm going to stir you up when I get up here. My husband is the put together, consistent, calm. I'm the crazy, loud mouth wife that I say, you know what? Hell no. You're not going to mess with my church, my kids, nobody else. And you're going to learn how passion actually precedes faith. And so my passion is going to stir you, I hope. And I hope you can grab a hold of a piece of it and you say, well, I'm just not that person. I'm the quiet one. I don't know why we stand and worship. Well, listen, we stand because we worship a God who's on, from heaven and earth, created everything, and he deserves to be honored. And I know that's an old thing to, to us. But I remember when we went to Ramah, we had <laughs> Kenneth Hagen was our teacher. I didn't know who he was. And all I know is that he walked in the room, and everybody was like, stand up. I was like, what? Why are we standing? And they were like, because it's an honor and a reverence for this man of God who has gone before us. And it's, it's an honor. And I believe if we honor God, God's going to bless our praise. He's going to bless us when we study the word. And so, Lord, we ask that you would teach us tonight, that you would equip us, that you would stir us, that you would change us, that you would grow us, Lord, that we'd, we'd see more clearly, that we would know you deeper in the name of Jesus. Amen. Awesome. Have you guys ever asked yourself some questions? Okay, these are these were some questions I was thinking about that I live on a daily basis, and sometimes I'm wondering if maybe you ask yourself these questions. Have you ever asked a question, is this happening again, really? Have you ever asked that question, or is it just me? Are your are my prayers redundant? Do I just pray the same thing over and over again? And it just feels like maybe it's just hitting the ceiling a little. Do you ever ask that question? Or is it just me? It's just Pastor Jess. How about, are we having the same conversation again? Didn't we understand what we talked about before? Have you ever asked that? Maybe you're a parent in this room and you have that that thought like, seriously, not again, right? We ask those questions. How about this one? Where is the money going to come from? Nobody's ever asked that one, right? I have no idea about that one. I'm still waiting for that one. Maybe you're actually in a good place, but you're wondering what's next? Like, I, I'm feeling like life's good. I can't say life's bad, but I just feel like, meh, God's, God's good. God's faithful. But what's next? What does he have for me? Well, I, I feel like I'm sitting on weight, and I don't know where God wants me to be. Well, how about tonight? I want to tell you something. That every single person in this room, if you're drawing breath out of your spirit, man, that you are in a daily fight, and it is called the good fight of faith. And I believe that when we ask those questions, I want to tell you something. You are normal. It's okay. Because sometimes we feel like we're not saved enough if we ask those questions. We're not, we're not meeting up to what God's level should take us to. I've had many conversations with people, people of all ages, believe it or not. I mean, I could talk to someone who's in their 50s. I could talk to somebody who's in their 70s. I could talk to somebody who is like a teenager, a preteen, and they all ask me the same question. What am I doing that I need to maintain this relationship with God? And I felt like, Holy Spirit, what are you trying to say to the church? And he told me, you have to fight for a relationship with me. Because everything else is fighting against you to not have one. And I felt, what does that mean, God? And he said, and then I was praying. And he's, I was listening to this new album. And have you ever just listened to a song and you're like, there's my answer. It was like this moment of, oh. I was in my car. I was by myself. And this song came on by Capital Kings. I don't even know if they have it, but we don't have time for it. But you can write it down. And it's called Fight On, Fighter. And I was like, ooh, I like this song. If you know me, like this is my, my cup of tea. And in one of the lines of the song, it said, 
fight on fighter. Let anyone, don't let anyone steal your fire. And I was like, ooh, that is, that's happened to me one too many times where maybe you believed God for something and you didn't get it and you didn't see what you, what you were praying and believing God for. So your fire got poured out. The enemy was able to kind of put some water on that fire. Maybe your marriage didn't turn out the way you thought it was going to turn out. And now you're feeling all these crazy, weird emotions. And are you good enough? And how come it couldn't have worked? And how come things didn't work out? And your fire got sizzled out. Maybe there's sickness in your body and you haven't seen your answer yet. But let me tell you something. Don't let the fire sizzle out. Because fight on, fighter. I'm here to tell you tonight, fight on, fighter. Don't give up. Don't let it sizzle out. Don't let your relationship with God be something that wanes in the, in the good fight of faith. What is the good fight of faith? It means, how does that even sound good? I'm, I'm in faith and it's a good fight, but sometimes I feel like it's a lonely fight. Sometimes I feel like the faith fight is annoying. Have you ever felt that way? Because you're just like, oh, this is annoying. Like, how come I have to be the one always apologizing? Have you ever felt that way? How come I'm the one, God? How come I'm the Well, really, that's the selfish, right? That's the selfish you. One time God told me, well, this ain't about you. you I keep hearing a lot of you in this. And I was like, ooh. Have <laughs> you ever been burned by God? You're like, sting. And that's what happened. And I began asking the Lord, fine, fine. Then what is the good fight of faith? And he said, your endurance to the end. Until you come to see me in eternity, you don't stop fighting. I said, but what if I get tired? He said, then you come and you get your strength from me. What if I want to just put my arms down because I'm sick of beating against the air, God? And he said, then you come and you rest in my presence. You allow my word to fill you back up and you strengthen yourselves for another day of a fight. Because on this earth, you're not going to stop fighting. Now, let me tell you something for those that are like, well, then I'm out. This Christianity thing is not for me. Well, you're going to get out in the world and you're going to fight just as much. So you could be on the good side or you could be on the bad side. You could be on the one with a whole bunch of tools, a whole bunch of love, a whole bunch of strength, a whole bunch of comfort, a whole bunch of support. Or you could be on the one that is going to drag your butt to hell. And it's going to lie to you. It's going to deceive you. It's going to bring nothing but devastation to you because you're fighting no matter what. Because there's a world out there, a supernatural world that we do not see or nor do we understand. We call it spirits. We call it demons. We call it whatever we want. Even right now in this day and age, in this time in our country, they're celebrating it and it's called a Halloween. And yet we don't understand that when we entertain demonic realms, that that is something we've opened the door to and it's a new fight you now have to take on. It's a new fight. So you choose what battle you want to fight in. I don't know about you, but I want to fight on God's side. I want to fight the God battle. I want to fight the good fight of faith. I don't want to fight the one that I've been to, the one that brought me down to hell, the one that was dragging me further and further away from God. And that absence from him was such a scary feeling. Has anybody ever been there and come back to the Lord? And you're like, never again, never, ever again do I want this chasm of separation between me and God. But you have to fight every day to keep your relationship good. You have to fight every day to keep the enemy away from what you know is truth. You have to fight every day because let me tell you something. He is knocking. He is seeking whom he may devour. And it's either you or it's the one that is weaker. What are you going to do? There's a man in the Bible, and I was thinking about this as I was listening to the song, and I was like, fight on fighter. Fight on fighter. And God was like, David was that. And I'm like, yeah. So I went back and read the, you know, the Bible book story of David and Goliath. And you're like, oh, I know this story. But I would challenge you, do you know this story? Because when we begin to dissect the story, we see some characters in David and some paths and ways that David can lead us to show us how to fight powerful ways, to show us how to break through in a fight, to show us how to be strong in a fight, to show us how to overcome during a fight. Because I don't want to be somebody who's defeated in a fight. I want to be someone who is the defeated one. Like I defeat them, they're going down no matter what. I'm the one standing at the end. And you know, I don't want to hear this from Goliath. I don't want to know how Goliath fights. If you know the story of David and Goliath, he was taken down by David, this little young man. 
They called him ruddy. I was like, what does that word even mean? And it means small. It means good looking. He was small and good looking. Is there any small good looking people around here? All the men would raise their hand because men are like, I look good. (laughs) Can I get that picture of Goliath up here? This is about 10 feet tall. Goliath was nine feet, about 11 inches tall. And I'm about the size of Goliath. Can you imagine coming up against this? But let me tell you, when your family is under attack from the enemy, this is what it looks like. When you get the bad report and you don't know if God doesn't do something, he better come through because if not, that Goliath is going to take your life out. How about that marriage? How about not knowing what to do next in life? We got a young, lot of young adults in here. You guys are stepping into new, new ways and new levels of maturity. That's a scary place to live. Coming out from under mom and dad, coming away from those things that are comfortable. But let me tell you something. It might look like Goliath, but let's learn some lessons from the one that took him out, who was way smaller than him. His name was David. So this is what we're going to do. We're going to learn how to fight a good fight. How do I fight a good fight? David has so many lessons for us on how to fight a good fight. Number one, you ready? You got to show up for the fight. You know, have you ever met those, those kids? I think about the, the school playground where they're like, okay, there's a bully. Okay, let's run the other way. Right? Like, or maybe you're like, you watch those, you know, I think of the Sandlot, you know, that movie. And I think of all these different movies where they just ran, they just ran until they muster up the courage to go after it. But David had no idea that this was what he was going to be walking into. Here's this young boy who has had a whole lot of time with God. And let me just make that point. A whole lot of alone time with God. He's been in the field taking care of his father's sheep. He's the youngest of all his brothers. They forgot about him. They don't know him. They just roll their eyes at him and think they know it all in his family. And oh, David, just go back with the sheep has been what this young man has lived. So David couldn't find his identity in his family. David had to go and find his identity from the one who created him. And as he's out there with the sheep, as he's out there taking care of them and nurturing them and making sure that nothing is going to come steal them and rip them apart and take them from the, the flock. Here is David praising and singing and learning how to be in the presence of the Almighty. And I thought to myself, he already showed up for the battle when he did that. You see, we got to prepare ourselves the right way for the battles that are going to come to us in the future. We can't control what's going to happen, but you know what we can control? We can tr- control how we're going to react when we're faced with it. And the only way you're going to react the way that we see David react is when you have first spent some time with God. He has showed up on the battlefield. He has showed up with the sheep. You say, the sheep aren't the battlefield? Oh, yeah? Well, guess what? While he was out there with the sheep, he killed a bear and he killed a lion with his bare hands. I don't know about you, but did you kill a bear or a lion with your bare hands? I think that David is very qualified to take care of himself. So how many times have you been underestimated? How many times has somebody said to you, just stay back, I'll take care of it? Oh, how about this? Oh, well, honey, I'll do it. I'll do it for you. Listen, stop. Stop babying people. It's time for people to step out and step up. It's time for them to step into who they're supposed to be. David was out there all on his own. He had to do it on his own. His dad did not come to his rescue. His brothers did not come to his rescue. But the one of the most high God, his name is Jesus, came to his rescue because he was in the presence of God and he was ready for the battle. So here's David and his dad and all his brothers go out to this war. You know, they leave him behind to stay with the sheep because that's what they thought of him. Oh, we'll leave the puny one behind. And here's David saying to his dad, can I, what can I do? What can I do? And his dad says, I want you to go see your brothers. Go bring them some food to the battlefield. In the meantime, switch over into a new world, right? They are on the battlefield and they are getting their butts kicked. The Philistines are coming after them. 
They have giants of the land coming and beating on them. And then they have one giant. His name is Goliath. And he begins to challenge the people of God. I'm going to read this to you. In 1 Samuel 17, 9. Go ahead and turn there if you have your word. I'm going to open mine up. Actually, go ahead and get into your word because we're going to go through this tonight. You know, do you know what this is? This is a Bible. Like You all should get one, not just on your phone. I'm going to challenge you. I'm, I'm totally a modern girl. I like using my word. But there's nothing like holding it in your hand and flipping through the pages and circling it and studying it. So get it into you. I want you to learn how to flip through the pages. We're going to go old school here. You might be like, but this is young adults and we're cool. Well, young adults, let's go vintage, okay, because that's cool. All right. Because God's word is powerful and sharper than any double-edged sword. i got to get it in me in order for when the battle comes for it to pour up out of me. So i got to get it in so it will come out. Right? So let's turn there. 1 Samuel 7, 9. Here's Goliath. He is taunting the Israelites. Woo, this guy. I was like, let me at him when I was reading this. And he says... He says, choose a man for yourselves, this is the verse before, and let him come down to me. Verse 9, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then he will be your servants. And if we prevail against him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. The word able, if you are able. How many of you say, well, I don't know if I'm able. We were, we were watching a movie the other day about um, the Holocaust it was a hard movie to watch. And at the end of it, you know, these people had rescued people and saved lives during the Holocaust. And Dan and I, after the movie, looked at each other and we said, would we do that? I hope we would. I hope we would be those people that would rescue and that would do anything we could to save their lives. Because God values his people. You see, here he was. He was coming against God's people. Right there, he messed up. Then he's taunting them and he says, if you're able... To be able in the Hebrew is a, is a word that talks about to have the capacity to succeed. Do you think you can succeed? Do you have the capacity to succeed? If you were to be asked that question tonight, I don't know how many people would go, yeah, I totally have the capacity to succeed. Or how many times do we go, I, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this class. I don't know if I'm going to make it in this marriage. I don't know if I'm going to make it to tomorrow because these thoughts and this anxiety and this depression are coming against me. But what he did was he began to say, are you able? And he was poking at him, poking at him, poking at him. David didn't know what he was walking into. Remember, he's just bringing food to his brothers, right? So let's go on and see what David does. He begins in in verse 20, we're going to go to verse 20. It says, so David rose early in the morning. He left the sheep with the keeper. He took the things and went to Jesse as he commanded him, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the camp as the army was going out to the fight and shouting for battle. Can you imagine like this little guy walking between everybody in the middle of their battle? And he's like, I got food, you know. I mean, they're not paying any attention to him, I'm sure. For Israel and the Philistines had drawn up a battle array, army against army. And David left his supplies in his hand of the, of the supply keeper. He ran to the army, and he came and greeted his brothers. I love that because he was like, thumbs up. Oh, I'm going to show up for this. Hey, do you think David was a little curious of what was going on? Like, you left me in the field, but I want to know what's up. There's something happening here. Something's going on. And as David went to go see his brothers, verse 23, then they all talked with him, and there was a champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, coming up from the armies of the Philistines, and he spoke accordingly to the words. And so David heard them, and all the men of Israel went, and they saw him, and they fled from him, and they were dreadfully afraid. You see, here was David minding his own business. He was taking food to his brothers, and he hears the fight. He hears the taunt. When the enemy comes at you and he says, are you able? Oh, you say you're more than enough. You say you're a son of God. You say you're a daughter of God. You say this, but are you? But are you? Are you? And he's taunting you. And the enemy comes and he taunts and he torments and he stirs in our head things that are unreal, things that are false ideas. There's been many times I've had conversations with people and I'm like, those are not your thoughts. 
Just, just so you know, those are not you. Those are the devil. So go ahead and tell the devil where he can put them. You see, sometimes if somebody just needs to tell you, that's not you. And then you can remind him, oh, yeah. Why am I letting him torment me? See, David was minding his own business, but he could not walk away from an injustice against God's people. He couldn't. He said, this is wrong. I felt, I could see David like, does anyone else hear what's going on? Yeah, they do. They're running like chickens. They're scared. In verse 31, it says, now the words of David, which, which were spoken, because he said, this is what David said. He said, your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. This little guy heard all of this and said, I will fight this Philistine. You see, David showed up for the fight. And it will, to show up to a fight will require some great confidence. It will require great faith for the victory. It will require Jesus Christ to be on your side. We can't hide from the fight. We can't sweep the fight under the rug. We cannot avoid the fight. How many of you have been in a fight with someone and you're like, this is really awkward because they're in the room right now and I don't want to talk to them. Avoiding the fight. I love Pastor Paul's message last week, confront the issue. You see, we can't avoid the fight any longer. Because when we avoid it, when we sweep it under the rug, when we don't take care of it, when we don't show up for it, guess what happens? We get overtaken. The enemy takes ground. The enemy begins to slither in and steal and, and deplete from our lives. But yet David said, well, hold on. This guy is taunting us. I'll fight him. I mean, he didn't even skip a beat. He was like, I know what to do. I'll fight this Philistine. That's crazy. This little guy showed up for the fight, and he was ready to go. How many of us are ready to go when the enemy shows up for the fight? Or are we worried and concerned and we're, we're patronizing over a decision and we're worried about it instead of going, hold on, I'm showing up for this fight. You're not going to mess with me. No, I'm showing up for this fight. This is not going to be the end result of this situation. I'm showing up for this fight because my God is still on the throne. I'm showing up for this fight because he's still the God of heaven and earth. I'm showing up for this fight because he's already walked me through some things. He showed up for you on that cross. The least we can do is show up for the fight now. You see, God is asking us to show up for the fight. Here, David was minding his own business, but he had to step into what God asked him to do, and it was to step in and show up for the fight. Number two thing that we can learn from David is we have to stay in the fight. So easy to get out of the fight. You know, I have three kids. I love all three of them. There, there's one kid that when, I won't say who they are, and Chloe, you don't look at me right now. Uh, so it's not Chloe, by the way. And when we give them an assignment to do in the house, the one kid seems to somehow slip away from the job assignment. And I'm constantly, my job during that time is, hello, where are you? Get back in the kitchen. No, you're going to help your brother and sister. No, you don't get to just go away and do that. Have you ever been that kid? Oh, wait, you're not going to raise your hand, are you? Have you ever had someone in your life that's that way? Where you're the one finishing the job for them, when you're the one doing it all, because they can't stay the course. And God is saying, stay the course. The fight's going to be hard. The fight's going to be rough. But I need you to stay the course. I need you to not give up. I need you not to step aside. I need you not to step out. I need you to step forward and keep moving forward. Sometimes your fight is going to look long. Sometimes your fight is going to be deep. Sometimes the fight is going to be really surface level, and you're going to go, I don't even really feel like I'm fighting right now. But that's because you're walking in a supernatural peace and a supernatural understanding, but you never stop fighting. You don't. You don't stop fighting. You say, when is this going to be over? It's not. So you better learn how to fight. Let's fight the good fight of faith tonight. So we're going to show up for the battle. We're going to stay in the fight. You see, Satan will do his best to minimize your place in the fight. He does it every time. But remember, you are the powerful one that the Holy Spirit is using and living within. So when the Satan comes to minimize you, David knew who he was. Because Why? Because he had spent time with God in the field. Because he had those moments and those preparation times with God. When he, the fight came, he was able to stay in. 
He was able to not be weary. He was not going to be taken out. David was able to stand firm in the fight. So here's David. The previous verses, I love this. I, I, I was like tripping on this. And he was talking to his brothers in verse 28. And right before this, right before, before he was talking to his brothers, he, they, they were saying, well, if we kill Goliath, there's benefit to it. Okay, so we can like have the daughter of Goliath, we get the wealth, and then the Philistines are all going to serve us. And everybody was like, okay. And so this is David's response. He was, he was frustrated hearing this. And so David starts asking questions and his brother speaks up, leave it to the one closest to you to go ahead and try and take you down, right? This is what it says. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was aroused against David. And he said, why did you come down here? With whom have you left your few sheep in the wilderness? He was belittling him in front of everybody. He was minimizing who David was and what David carried. I know your pride and your insolence of your heart. That means the rudeness of your heart. So he's calling David out and calling him names. He's saying, you're prideful and you're rude. And I know the reason you do this. And he says, for you have come down here to the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Have you ever felt that way? Like, why are you still picking on me? What have I done now? And this is the response. Is there not a cause? Is there not a cause to stay in the fight? Is there not a cause to serve God faithfully and righteously to the end of our lives? Is there not a cause to go against the cultural currents like Pastor Dan has been talking about? Is there not a cause to stand up for what is right and deny what is wrong? Is there not a cause for us not to wink at sin and allow it to play in our families and in our lives and for us to say, it's all right, we forgive you, but you know, there's a cause. His name is Jesus. And he says, you must repent. You must get right. You must stand. And this is holy ground. You don't get to come before the throne room unless you understand the holiness and the goodness of God. That is the cause. The cause is eternal life. The cause is going to heaven and being with our God. The cause is getting as many people knowing and understanding the word of God, bringing them into heaven with us, not leaving them behind to go to hell. That's the cause. And here's David going, isn't there a cause? They're stuck on the, the wife and the wealth and, the, and being served by the Philistines. And David sees past all that foolishness. Then he turned from him toward another and he said the same thing. So David repeats himself again to another group of people there. And they responded to David the same way his brother did. That had to be a frustrating moment. Have you ever been passionate about something and you're like telling someone about it and they're like, okay. And then you go tell somebody, okay. And you're kind of like, well, okay. Well, I guess maybe it's just me. You see, I bet you David felt that in that moment. But I, there was a righteous anger inside him. Verse 30, then he turned from him towards another. They said the same thing. Verse 31, now when the words of David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul and, and he sent for them. So they were irritated with him and they told the big boss about him. Oh, this guy over here is saying, isn't there a cause? We're out here working. We're out here fighting this, this Philistine. This little guy, this ruddy little boy wants to come out here, and he wants to say, is there a cause? Well, of course there's a cause. What do you think we're doing? Gosh, but they didn't get it. They missed it. Their fear blinded them. Their faith was not working. But here's this little boy who had just come out of the presence of God. He was in the field alone, in the presence, walks into the battle, sees right away with clear eyes, untainted eyes, un, like unveiled before the Lord and says, isn't there a cause? What are we doing here? Do we not know who we are? Hello? Sometimes I feel like that as pastor. Come on, church. Do we not know who we are? Why are we letting him knock on our doors and kick our kids around? Why are we letting him come in and lie to us? 
Why? 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 And yet David is saying, isn't there a cause? When the odds are against you, when people want to discourage you, when no one believes in the fight, because you may be alone in your fight. People are going to say, that's stupid. Why would you do that? What are you believing? That's crazy talk. But when you get a word from God, when you've been in the presence of the maker of heaven and earth, when you know his presence, you can stand firm and go, what? Isn't there a cause? Isn't there a cause? You can't give up, church. You have to stay in the fight anyways. You have to rehearse when you're staying in the fight. You have to rehearse the past victories. You see, David showed us that. So here he goes before Saul. And David is talking to Saul in verse 34 through 37. And Saul is saying to him, no, you can't go out. I mean, even Saul, here's Saul going, come on. You can't go out, kid. And he says this. He says, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep my father's sheep. Ooh, I love that. Used to keep. You see, he already stepped into a new position of authority. In his mind and in his heart, he understood that he is no longer the sheep keeper. He's now the warrior for Jesus Christ. He's the one that's representing God of the Most High God. He's the one that is standing in the gap for Israel. That's big. He already changed his definition of where his position was. I used to keep my father's sheep, and when, he, when a lion and a bear came and he took the lamb out of the flock, I went out after it, and I struck it, and it delivered the, and it delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard, and I struck it, and I killed it. The servant has killed both lion and bear, and the uncircumcised Philistine, who I love this, will be like, be like one of them, seeing he has defiled the armies of the living God. After this, David, Saul says, okay, you can go. You see, rehearse what God has done for you. Rehearse it. Because the devil's going to come to try and steal it from you. But you need to remind yourself and those around you what God has done for you. As pastor, I have seen God deliver people from the craziest situations. From those situations where they should have died. When they got their miracle, they walked away from God. And it is the hardest thing for me to see. Because what? After everything he did for you. You see, do not be that Christian. Do not be that son. Do not be that daughter that walks away from the miracle, that takes God for granted. But here's David going, oh, no, let me tell you what he's done for me and what I did through him. And he rehearsed, and he began to put himself in a new place of authority in the fight. Put yourself in a place of authority. Don't let the devil tell you how to be moved. You tell the devil how to move. You tell him where to go and what to do. You stay in this fight. When the odds are against you and people discourage you, you stay in the fight. When everything says to run, you can't. Fight to stay. Maybe that's your fight right now. You're fighting just to stay. You're fighting to stay in the fight. People are going to think you're crazy. What are you doing fighting to stay in the fight? No, I'm fighting for my marriage because I believe God gave me a word. I'm fighting for my healing because I believe God's going to touch my body. I'm fighting for my kids because maybe they look like they've gone south for the winter. I'm telling you right now, I am fighting for them, and I'm not letting them go. I am fighting for those things that I do not see because that's what God has asked me to do. But I'm staying to fight. I'm fighting to stay, and that's my job right now. You see, he showed up for the battle. He stayed in the fight. The last point, there's so many in this that I could keep preaching on David forever. I know my dad has an incredible class on this in Bible college. If you want to connect there on a deeper level, you can. But the third one is speak faith over the fight. You see, in the fight, it's easy to talk about what is right in front of you. I mean, you could look at Goliath, right? Go ahead and put that picture up. I could go ahead and look at this man and go, Yep, I don't have a chance. Oh, oh no, but, but he's so big. Look at all his armor. Look at all his gear. And it does, in the word, explain everything he guarded himself with. And here's this little sheep herder walking in with nothing. So Saul dresses him up. He says, if you're going out for battle, you're going to wear my fatigue. You're going to wear my stuff. So Saul puts on all of his armor on David, and it's just oversized, and it doesn't look right. And David takes it off. He says, I'm not going to do this. 
So David does this. Now listen, this is a trendy little purse. But David had a satchel. And David went and he picked up five stones from the river and his slingshot. And he said, I got this. This is all I need. He's looking at Goliath. And he's looking a little not ready for the battle. When I'm looking at this, this doesn't look like faith to anyone else, right? Does this look like faith to you? What if I had a big sword, a shield, and everything guarded on? Would that look like faith to you? Right, right? She's prepared. She's ready. She's definitely able to do this. Well, here's David going, all I need is this and this, because really this is nothing. It's a tool in the hand of God. What are you doing in faith? How are you fighting your battle? Are you fighting it in faith or are you fighting it out in the flesh? Because your battle will not be won in flesh. You will always lose. You will always fail. You have to get the word in you and you have to fight it in faith. So here's David. Saul is telling him, no, you're not good enough. His brothers just told him, you're not good enough. And yet he's allowed to go out onto the battlefield. And guess what he faces when he gets out there? Big, giant Goliath saying, what is this? Really? You're sending this? Oh, come on. And Goliath is mad. He's actually offended that this is what they're sending out to battle him. How many times has the devil looked at us and been like, really? This is what you got? Oh, you're just a cute little package of nothing. You're just, you're not full of anything strong or full of strength. Oh, but strength comes in little packages. And here was this David kid ready to go, ready to kill Goliath. And I love this because in 1 Samuel 45 through 47, let's see what happens. Whew. Then David said to this Philistine after he has been taunting him, you come to me with sword, spear, and javelin. He's probably screaming because this guy's way tall. He said, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of angel armies, whom you have defiled. This day the Lord will, not the Lord may, I'm just kind of shuddering in my boots as a little kid, like, <laughs> with my slingshot, like, the Lord will. No. David's like, and the Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you I will take your head from you well he goes on to in deeper explanation sometimes you're going to need to get in the devil's face and you're not just going to need to tell him where to go but you're going to need to tell him how to get there you're going to need to tell him how and what path he can take where to shove it and where he doesn't get to come back to you're going to have to tell him that this is how it's going to go down. I'm going to do this. I'm going to say this. And you're not bigger than me, buddy. I'm bigger than you. And that's what David was doing. He was standing up against this Goliath who wanted to tell him he wasn't good enough, wanted to tell him you're going to lose this battle. And he says, let me tell you how it's going to be. I will strike you. I will take your head from you. What? Can you imagine this big Goliath going, you're going to take my head from me? But I bet you there was something inside of him like, ooh, I like the gumption in this little guy. Let's fight. I'm ready to go. Because he's a warrior, remember? And so he says, and I will give the carcass of the camp of the Philistines. I will give your carcass to the camp of the Philistines and the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth and all that may know that there is a God in Israel. And then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword or your javelin or your spear for the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into my hands. You see, woo, he began to speak some faith to his giant. What's your giant today? What are you looking at that seems impossible? What are you stepping into that you're afraid shaking in your boots with? Maybe you just need to stop shaking and you need to step into some Holy Ghost boots. And you need to stand with your feet that are shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You need to put on the helmet of salvation. Pull out your sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The shield of faith and the breastplate of righteousness. And you need to stand holy before God. You need to get rid of sin in your life. You need to quit dabbling in things that are going to take you straight to hell. And you need to get serious with God. Because when you stand against the enemy, you better be ready. Because he will take you out if you're not. You see, David, let's go all the way back 
could handle the faith talk with Goliath because he had first been in the presence of God. You can't talk to your giant in faith if you don't know your God. You can't talk to the giant and speak faith over your life if you don't know what the word says about your situation. You can't go and have a conversation with the enemy if you're not filled up with the spirit of God ready to speak through you and to them to take them down. You see, he understood who he was. He understood what faith was going to happen. It's your time to start pulling some faith out in your life. It's time for you to start telling that situation how it's going to be. Remind the enemy of who you are because see, Goliath was like, this is who I am. And he was like, let me tell you who I am. He took out that slingshot in this story. Let's read about it. I love the end of this. It says, and so it was when the Philistine arose, he came and he drew near to David. And David hurried and he ran towards the army to meet with the Philistine. Oh, he ran to battle. I don't know about you, if anybody knows who I am, when I find out that, that the enemy is doing something, I'm kind of like the person you probably want to get on your side. Because I'm like, oh, hell no, let's go. Like, and you say, what is she cussing? Yeah, he is from hell, and he has no place in my life, and you don't get to live in my world of God. You get to go back to hell where you came from. You see, when I come across something demonic, when I come across something that's not okay, just the other day, something kept happening in my life. And I was like, how did I not recognize this a long time ago? But let me give you a little tip. When there's chaos and confusion going on in your world, it's demonic. Because that's how the enemy works. He brings chaos and he brings confusion. And this happened and the Holy Spirit said to me, you need to nip this in the butt. You know what to do. So I gathered the people that were a part of it and I said, we need to fight. We need to pray. We need to fight. They looked at me like I was crazy. So I was alone in my fight for a second. But then after a while, they were like, no, you're right. Yep, you're right. Let's pray. We got together. We prayed. I believe we broke something off. I believe that the enemy was no longer to ha able to have any more ground in that area, in that place. You see, you've got to stay in the fight, and then you've got to speak faith over the fight. You've got to understand your opponent, and you can't let the enemy take you down. So here's David. David put his hand down. He took out a stone. I love this. He slung it, and he struck the Philistine in the forehead. I read about this. Did you know that they were so good as stone throwers, as people with, um, what are they called? I can, slings, thank you. <laughs> and they were so good with it that they could split hairs. That's how good they were with the slingshot. They, they could split hairs on someone's head. I was like, what? You see, they didn't need no gun. He didn't even need a sword. He just needed his slingshot. Because David was in the field all alone with a whole bunch of rocks and bored. Guess what David was doing? He was perfecting his battle stance. He was perfecting his weapon. He was perfecting his strategy. Go be with God and perfect it so that you can step out in faith when you need to. You see, here's David. David prevailed over this Philistine. He slung that stone and then he killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. So therefore David ran. He stood over the Philistine. He took his sword. Whoop! And he drew it out and the sheath and he killed him and he cut off his head with it. And when the Philistines saw this, they, their champion was dead. They fled. Woo! They fled. You see, David spoke the word over his situation. David stepped out in faith. David did not allow anything to overcome him. I love what David did here. And you have the story of a lifetime in front of you. What's your battle story going to look like? What are you going to do when hell hits the fan? I'm looking at Pastor Joey and Marnie right now. When their baby was born and his heart was ripped open. And he had surgery after surgery on his heart. What was Joey and Marnie saying? What were they like? You know what? They were stand, hold, no holds bar. I remember going in the door. He's like, no, he's going to be fine. He's going to be healed. He's not dying. He's going to live. 
No, my God, my God, my God's going to take care of him. If you see little Judah now, that kid is the most passionate, hyperest little kid because he has a whole lot to praise God for. His life is full, but mama and daddy stood in the gap and they fought that good fight of faith and they saw it to the end. And I know that God, just like he did for them, he'll do it for you. You see, David had a story to tell. David showed us how to fight a good fight of faith. It is your turn now. It's David's gone. David's ran his course. David has served his, his call. David has met his goal. But if you are breathing in this room, your fight isn't over. So what are, what's your battle tonight? I want you to take some time for a second. I don't know how much time I got. Am I late? I want you to take some time. I want you to write down real quick what your battle is. Just take a moment. This is my battle. Okay, maybe it's a 